Chapter 7, Part 2 of Aircraft and Submarines by Willis J. Abbott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by William Tomko. Some Methods of the War in the Air, Part 2. Shells or bombs of these varying types were dropped from airplanes as well as from the larger and steadier Zeppelins. The difference was entirely in the size. It was said that a Zeppelin might drop a bomb of a ton's weight, but so far as attainable records are concerned, it is impossible to cite any instance of this being done. The effect on the great gas bag of the sudden release of a load so great would certainly cause a sudden upward flight which might be so quick and so powerful as to affect the very structure of the ship. So far as known, 250 pounds was the topmost limit of Zeppelin bombs, while most of them were of much smaller dimensions. The airplane bombs were seldom more than 60 pounds in weight, although in the larger British machines a record of 95 pounds has been attained. The most common form of bomb used in the heavier-than-air machines was pear-shaped, with a whirling tail to keep the missile upright as it falls. Steel balls within a little larger than ordinary shrapnel, are held in place by a device which releases them during the fall. On striking the ground, they fall on the explosive charge within, and the shell bursts, scattering the two or three hundred steel bullets which it carries over a wide radius. Bombs of this character weigh in the neighborhood of six pounds, and an ordinary airplane can carry a very considerable number. Their exploding device is very delicate, so that it will operate upon impact with water very soft earth, or even the covering of an airship. Other bombs commonly used in airplanes were shaped like darts, winged like an arrow, so that they would fall perpendicularly and explode by a pusher at the point which was driven into the body of the bomb upon its impact with any hard substance. It seems curious to read of the devices sometimes quite complicated, and at all times the result of the greatest care and thought used for dropping these bombs. In the trenches, men pitched explosive missiles about with little more care than if they had been so many baseballs, but only seldom was a bomb from aloft actually delivered by hand. In the case of the heavier bombs used by the dirigibles, this is understandable. They could not be handled by a single man without the aid of mechanical devices. Some are dropped from a cradle, which is tilted into a vertical position after the shell has been inserted. Others are fired from a tube, not unlike the torpedo tube of a submarine, but which imparts only slight initial velocity to the missile. Its chief force is derived from gravity, and to be assured of its explosion, the aviator must discharge it from a height proportionate to its size. In the airplane, the aviator's methods are more simple. Sometimes the bombs are carried in a rack beneath the body of the machine, and released by means of a lever at the side. A more primitive method often in use is merely to attach the bomb to a string and lower it to a point at which the aviator is certain that in falling it will not touch any part of the craft and then cut the string. Half a dozen devices by which the aviator can hold the bomb at arm's length and drop it with the certainty of a perpendicular fall are in use in the different air navies. It will be evident to the most casual consideration that with any one of these devices employed by an aviator in a machine going at a speed of 60 miles an hour or more, the matter of hitting the target is one in which luck has a very great share. There is good reason for the pains taken by the aviators to see that their bombs fall swift and true, and clear of all the outlying parts of their machines. The grenadier in the trenches has a clear field for his explosive missile, and he may toss it about with what appears to be desperate carelessness. Although instances have been known in which a bomb-thrower, throwing back his arm preparatory to launching his canned volcano, has struck the back of his own trench with disastrous results. But the aviator must be even more careful. His bombs must not hit any of the wires below his machine and falling, else there will be a dire fall for him and above all they must not get entangled in stays or braces. In such a case, landing will bring a most unpleasant surprise. A striking case was that of a bomber who had been out over the German trenches. He had a two-man machine, had made a successful flight, and had dropped effectively, as he supposed, all his bombs. Returning in serene consciousness of a day's duty well done, he was about to spiral down to the landing place when his passenger looked over the side of the car to see if everything was in good order. Emphatically, it was not. 
To his horror, he discovered that two of the bombs had not fallen, but had caught in the running gear of his machine. To attempt a landing with the bombs in this position would have been suicidal. The bombs would have instantly exploded and annihilated both machine and aviators. But to get out of the car, climb down on the wires, and try to unhook the bombs seemed more desperate still. Stabilizers and other devices, now in common use, had not then been invented, and to go out on the wing of a biplane, or to disturb its delicate balance, was unheard of. Nevertheless, it was a moment for desperate remedies. The pilot clung to his controls, and sought to meet the shifting strains, while the passenger climbed out on the wing, and then upon the running gear. To trust yourself two thousand feet in mid-air, with your feet on one piano wire, and one hand clutching another, while with the other hand you grope blindly for a bomb charged with high explosive, is an experience for which few men would yearn. But, in this case, it was successful. The bombs fell, nobody cared where, and the two imperiled aviators came to ground safely. A form of offensive weapon which for some reason seems peculiarly horrible to the human mind is the flechette. These are steel darts a little larger than a heavy lead pencil, and with the upper two-thirds of the stem deeply grooved, so that the greater weight of the lower part will cause them to fall perpendicularly. These are used in attacks upon dense bodies of troops. Particularly have they proved effective in assailing cavalry, for the nature of the wounds they produce invariably maddens the horses who suffer from them and causes confusion that will often bring grave disaster to a transport or artillery train. Though very light, these arrows, when dropped from any considerable height, inflict most extraordinary wounds. They have been known to penetrate a soldier's steel helmet, to pass through his body and that of the horse he bestrode, and bury themselves in the earth. In the airplane, they are carried in boxes of one hundred each, placed over an orifice in the floor. A touch of the aviator's foot, and all are discharged. The speed of the machine causes them to fall at first in a somewhat confused fashion, with the result that before all have finally assumed their perpendicular position, they have been scattered over a very considerable extent of air. Once fairly pointed downward, they fall with unerring directness points downwards to their mark. It is a curious fact that not long after these arrows first made their appearance in the French machines, they were imitated by the Germans, but the German darts had stamped upon them the words, made in Germany, but invented by the French. One of the duties of the fighting airmen is to destroy the observation balloons which float in great numbers over both the lines tugging lazily at the ropes by which they are held captive, while the observers perched in their baskets communicate the results of their observations by telephone to staff officers at a considerable distance. These balloons are usually anchored far enough back of their own lines to be safe from the ordinary artillery fire of their enemies. They were therefore fair game for the mosquitoes of the air, but they were not readily destroyed by such artillery as could be mounted on an ordinary airplane. Bullets from the machine guns were too small to make any rents in the envelope that would affect its stability. Even if incendiary, they could not carry a sufficiently heavy charge to affect so large a body. The skin of the sausages, as the balloons were commonly called from their shape, was too soft to offer sufficient resistance to explode a shell of any size. The war was pretty well under way before the precise weapon needed for the destruction was discovered. This proved to be a large rocket, of which eight were carried on an airplane, four on each side. They were discharged by powerful springs, and a mechanism started which ignited them as soon as they had left the airplane behind. The head of each rocket was of pointed steel, very sharp and heavy enough to pierce the balloon's skin. Winslow was fortunate enough to be present when the first test of this weapon was made. In his book, With the French Flying Corps, he thus tells the story. Swinging lazily above the field was a captive balloon. At one end of Le Bourget was a line of waiting airplanes. This is the second. They have already brought down one balloon, remarked the man at my elbow. The hum of a motor caused me to look up. A wide-winged double motor, Caudron, had left the ground and was mounting gracefully above us. Up and up it went, describing a great circle, until it faced the balloon. Everyone caught his breath. The Caudron was rushing straight at the balloon, diving for the attack. Now, cried the crowd, there was a loud crack, a flash, 
and eight long rockets darted forth, leaving behind a fiery trail. The aviator's aim, however, was wide, and to the disappointment of everyone, the darts fell harmlessly to the ground. Another motor roared far down the field, and a tiny appareil de chasse shot upward like a swallow. A new port, shouted the crowd as one voice. Eager to atone for his captain's failure, and impatient at his delay in getting out of the way, the tiny biplane tossed and tumbled about in the air like a clown in the circus ring. Look, he's looping. He falls. He slips. No, he writes again, cried a hundred voices as the skillful pilot kept our nerves on edge. Suddenly, he darted into position and for a second hovered uncertain. Then, with a dive like that of a dragonfly, he rushed down to the attack. Again, a sheet of flame and a shower of sparks. This time, the balloon sagged. The flames crept slowly around its silken envelope. Touché, cried the multitude. Then the balloon burst and fell to the ground, a mass of flames. High above the little Newport, saucily continued its pranks, as though contemptuous of such easy prey. It may be properly noted at this point that the captive balloons or kite balloons have proved of the greatest value for observations in this war. Lacking, of course, the mobility of the swiftly moving airplanes, they have the advantage over the latter of being at all times in direct communication by telephone with the ground and being able to carry quite heavy scientific instruments for the more accurate mapping out of such territory as comes within their sphere of observation. They are not easy to destroy by artillery fire, for the continual swaying of the balloon before the wind perplexes gunners in their aim. At a height of 600 feet, a normal observation post, the horizon is nearly 30 miles from the observer. In flat countries like Flanders, or at sea, where the balloon may be sent up from the deck of a ship, this gives an outlook of the greatest advantage to the army or fleet relying upon the balloon for its observations of the enemy's dispositions. Most of the British and French observation balloons have been of the old-fashioned spherical form which officers in those services find sufficiently effective. The Germans, however, claimed that a balloon might be devised which would not be so very unstable in gusty weather. Out of this belief grew the Parseval Zickfield balloon, which from its form took the name of the sausage. In fact, its appearance, far from being terrifying, suggests not only that particular edible, but a large dill pickle floating awkwardly in the air. In order to keep the balloon always pointed into the teeth of the wind, there was attached to one end of it a large surrounding bag hanging from the lower half of the main envelope. One end of this, the end facing forward, is left open, and into this the wind blows, steadying the whole structure after the fashion of the tail of a kite. The effect is somewhat grotesque, as anyone who has studied the numerous pictures of balloons of this type employed during the war must have observed. It looks not unlike some form of tumor growing from a healthy structure. Captive or kite balloons are especially effective as coast guards. Posted 50 miles apart along the threatened coast, they can keep a steady watch over the sea for more than 25 miles toward the horizon. With their telephonic connections, they can notify airplanes in waiting or for that matter, swift destroyers, of any suspicious sight in the distance, and secure an immediate investigation which will perhaps result in the defeat of some attempted raid. Requiring little power for raising and lowering them, and few men for their operation, they form a method of standing sentry guard at a nation's front door, which can probably be equaled by no other device. The United States, at the moment of the preparation of this book, is virtually without any balloons of this type the first one of any pretensions having been tested in the summer of 1917. As late as the third year of the war, it could not be said that the possibilities of aerial offense had been thoroughly developed by any nation. The Germans indeed had done more than any of the belligerents in this direction with their raids on the British coast and on London. But, as already pointed out, these raids as serious attacks on strategic positions were mere failures. Advocates of the increased employment of aircraft in this fashion insist that the military value to Germany of the raids lay not so much in the possibility of doing damage of military importance, but rather in the fact that the possibility of repeated and more effective raids compelled Great Britain to keep at home a force of 30,000 to 50,000 men constantly on guard, 
who but for this menace would have been employed on the battlefields of france in this argument there is a measure of plausibility indeed between january nineteen fifteen and june thirteenth nineteen seventeen the germans made twenty-three disastrous raids upon england killing more than seven hundred persons and injuring nearly twice as many the amount of damage to property has never been reported nor is it possible to estimate the extent of injury inflicted upon the works of a military character the extreme secrecy with which great britain in common with the other belligerents has enveloped operations of this character makes it impossible at this early day to estimate the military value of these exploits merely to inflict anguish and death upon a great number of civilians and those largely women and children is obviously of no military service but if such suffering is inflicted in the course of an attack which promises the destruction or even the crippling of works of military character like arsenals munition plants or naval stores it must be accepted as an incident of legitimate warfare the limited information obtainable in wartime seems to indicate that the german raids had no legitimate objective in view but were undertaken for the mere purpose of frightfulness the methods of defence employed in great britain where all attacks must come from the sea were mainly naval what might be called the outer or flying defences consisted of fast armed fighting seaplanes and dirigibles stationed on the coast and ready on the receipt of a wireless warning from scouts either aerial or naval that an enemy air flotilla was approaching the coast they could at once fly forth and give it battle a thorough defence of the british territory demanded that the enemy should be driven back before reaching the land once over british territory the projectiles discharged whether by friend or foe did equal harm to the people on the ground below accordingly every endeavor was made to meet and beat the raiders before they had passed the barrier of sea beside the flying defenses there were the floating defenses anti-aircraft guns were mounted on different types of ships stationed far out from the shore and ever on the watch but these latter were of comparatively little avail for flying over the channel or the north sea the invaders naturally flew at a greater height they had no targets there to seek steered by their compasses and were entirely indifferent to the prospect beneath them moreover anti-aircraft guns hard to train effectively from an immovable mount were particularly untrustworthy when fired from the deck of a rolling and tossing ship in the turbulent channel third in the list of defences of the british coast or of any other coast which may at any time be threatened with an aerial raid are defensive stations equipped not only with anti-aircraft guns and searchlights but with batteries of strange new scientific instruments like the listening towers equipped with huge microphones to magnify the sound of the motors of approaching aircraft so that they would be heard long before they could be seen range finders and other devices for the purpose of gauging the distance and fixing the direction of an approaching enemy end of some methods of the war in the air part two recording by william tomko